Welcome to this Talks at Google virtual event. I'm Lee Gallagher, and I'm Director of External Affairs here at Google. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's guest, and I'm also a longtime admirer. He is a renowned journalist at heart, having served as the editor-in-chief of Time and also as CEO of CNN and the Aspen Institute. Walter is now back in his hometown of New Orleans and as a professor of history at Tulane. But you may know him best as an author, and it's quite possible you've read one of his many books. He may be the best known biographer we have today. His subjects include luminaries like Steve Jobs, Leonardo da Vinci, Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, and now the first woman who is the sole subject of his latest book. The Code Breaker, Jennifer Doudna, Gene Editing, and the Future of the Human Race tells the gripping account of how Nobel Prize winner Jennifer Doudna and her colleagues launched the CRISPR revolution that will allow us to cure diseases, fend off viruses, and improve the human species. It's a fascinating book, and I want to make sure we get to lots of audience questions. So as you think of questions throughout the conversation, and we hope you will, please be sure to add them to the live chat on the right. I also want to give a very special thanks to Matt Bongiovi out of our London office. Matt brought this talk to Google and was instrumental in its preparation. So a big thank you to Matt. Walter Isaacson, it is my great honor to welcome you to Doc Talks at Google. Thank you very much. It's my great honor to be with you, Lee. We worked together in a previous century at Time Inc. And I admire your book on Airbnb. You're a great yeah. journalist. Thanks. Thank you, Walter. Well, that it means the world coming coming from you. And it's true. We were, we were colleagues once upon a time. Um, well, it's great to have you here today. And congratulations on the book. Um, I guess first I have to ask, how did you arrive at Jennifer Doudna as a subject, especially given the broadcast of characters involved in the discovery and the development of CRISPR gene editing? Well, first, I decided I wanted to do something on the revolution that was happening in the life sciences. You know, everybody on this uh, broadcast and podcast has been in the forefront of the digital revolution. But the digital revolution is now being joined by another form of coding, you know, the code of life, in which we're going to combine computational biology together in order to create new ways to make vaccines and to edit our own genes. And so around the year 2000, when the Human Genome Project finished sequencing the human genome, you began to see this flowering of the possibility of a life sciences revolution. And I was looking for a way into it. I like writing narratives. I like writing narratives about people. And so I went around from lab to lab with George Church at Harvard and Fong Zhang in, uh, at MIT and Manuel Charpentier in Paris and got to know Jennifer Doudna at Berkeley. And she seemed to be a very uh, interesting main character. All those other people are important characters in the book, but she seemed to tie together the whole thing from the beginning of the discovery of the structure of DNA when she was in middle school and read the double helix and became fascinated by Rosalind Franklin, uh, the you know woman in the book who did the imaging that leads to this uh, structure of DNA for Jim Watson and Francis Crick, all the way through figuring out the role of RNA in creating life on our planet, to RNA as a guide to use for gene editing, and now RNA as a messenger to build proteins for our vaccine, like the spike protein for the coronavirus. And finally, she's the one who's been at the forefront of wrestling with the moral issue involved, issues involved. So those of us who like to try to personalize a narrative, uh, you know, we, we look for sort of a great central character. And the more I got to know her, and the more I liked her, the more I realized she was the perfect central character. She was it. So what is, this is sort of a process question, which I of course love, but what is the process of getting cooperation um, in this case, but also in general, have you had cooperation from all of your past subjects? I mean, the living Well, ones, sure, I, I lived with, um, you know, in, with Steve Jobs at, as guest house for, you know, much of the time, especially the last year of his life. And uh, I'm an old journalist like you, so I kind of know that if you call people and you say, I'd like to talk about you. Most people would be really happy because that's the most interesting subject in the world to them is to be able to talk about themselves. And so I, you know, even when I called um, Fong Zhang, who is a great rival and competitor of Jennifer Dowd, and I said I was writing a book with Jennifer as the main character, 
he was eager to talk. Uh, he invited me into his lab at Kendall Square. You know, we had spent a lot of time together, even went to Quebec together and out to dinner where CRISPR research was being done. So I don't find it very hard getting people to talk. Um, and, you know, journalists who grew up, uh, as I did in the 80s and 90s, uh, we spent a lot of time just hanging out and getting people to talk. That helps make it a narrative, helps make the book a journey of discovery, because you can watch in real time how real people are discovering things. Absolutely. Uh, so we've read a lot about it and, and you've touched on it, but can you can you just explain what CRISPR is and how it's used for gene editing? Sure. Well, CRISPR is something bacteria have been using for more than a billion years. So it's pretty simple. They're not all that smart. But what they do is whenever they get attacked by a virus, they take a little mugshot of it, a little snippet of the genetic material of the virus, and they incorporate it in these clustered repeated sequences in their own uh, genetic code. And they're called CRISPRs. And so if the virus ever attacks again, they've got this mugshot and they can use an enzyme to cut it up, just a pair of molecular scissors to cut it up. Well, this turns out to be pretty useful uh, in an era when we seem to be getting attacked by wave after wave of virus variants. But it, when Jennifer Dowden and Emmanuel Sharpenche discovered the components of this system, the essential components, they realized that they could reprogram it. Now, everybody on this I don't have to explain reprogramming <laughs> to this crowd, but that makes it into a molecule that can be like a microchip. If you uh, want to reprogram it so that it's not simply attacking uh, the genetic code of a virus, you can say, okay, I want you to cut up our own uh, genetic code at this spot. I want you to target this sequence of our DNA. So maybe I can target it so, you know, I can change the hair colors of my children or the, uh, you know, take out a mutation that causes sickle cell. So that's what they discovered was how to reprogram and repurpose and re-engineer this, this ancient system bacteria have called CRISPR in order to make it into a tool that would edit human DNA. It's pretty amazing. And can you talk just for a minute about how exactly CRISPR technology has been used in the fight against the coronavirus, how it was, how critical it was in the development of the vaccines? Well, the basic um, technology and the basic science involves RNA. And we all know about DNA because that's the famous molecule that gets on magazine covers. But RNA is actually the worker molecule. You know, DNA just sits in the... Um, nucleus of our cells curating information. We all know famous people like that. Whereas RNA goes and takes that information and does things with it. The two major things RNA can do, one is act as a guide for an enzyme to cut or do something. And that's what happens with gene editing. It can also act as a messenger to go to the uh, manufacturing region of our cells and say, manufacture this protein. And that's what happens in the basic you know, dogma of biology. The basic life is that at any moment, messenger RNAs are going from uh, the DNA in the nucleus of our cells and saying, make this hair follicle or make this fingernail or this hormone or this enzyme or this neuron, or in the case of the vaccines for the coronavirus, make this fragment of the spike protein so you can stimulate our immune systems to fight it if the real spike protein and its coronavirus comes along. So we use it for messenger RNA vaccines. We can use CRISPR to directly kill virus in our system, but that's still we still need to perfect how to deliver it into the right cells. And it's already also being used as a detection technology. So we're now rolling out these home CRISPR kits that can detect any uh, genetic sequence, including that of the coronavirus. And it's like a home pregnancy test. You can do it and instantly you can know. And those will be available in the next few months, not only for coronavirus, but everything from strep throat to bacterial infections or to detect a cancer tumor that you may have had sequenced to see if it's coming back. So this will change biology by having this reprogrammable systems uh, 
that we can use to detect, to destroy, and to vaccinate against things we don't want. You know, I heard you say in an interview that you, you know, you knew this was really significant. Obviously, you chose to write a book about it, but you said after you got into the research, you felt that you had even understated it, like it was even <laughs> bigger than you thought, right? I mean, um, well, you know, I I went to my editor and said I want to do a book on a technology with an, un, you know, an acronym nobody can remember, uh, led by a woman who, you know, last name most people can't pronounce and have never heard of. And but I said, trust me, this technology is going to be important. But after coronavirus, after Jennifer Doudna wins the Nobel Prize, and after we've edited the embryos of babies in China to produce designer babies, it suddenly became clear to me that this was even more uh, exciting and also uh, more important than I had originally thought. Absolutely. So you mentioned the, the, the babies that were born in China. I was going to ask you about that. Um, obviously, you know, CRISPR presents so much potential, but it also, you know, presents moral, ethical questions and, you know, the, the capability of making precise changes to the human genome and all the kinds of difficult questions around that. Can you just tell us at first about the, the ba those babies and, and what was that story and why was it so controversial? There was a young Chinese scientist is uh, named Hushuan Ki, and he came to a lot of Jennifer Doudna's conferences in the United States, even has a selfie that he took with her at Cold Spring Harbor Labs when they were there together. But then he goes back to China, and in an experiment that wasn't really authorized, he edited the embryos of unborn what became twin girls. And when you do that, you're not only making an edit in the twin girls, you're making an inheritable edit that will be in all their reproductive cells, their children, all of their descendants. So in effect, you're editing the human race. And what he did was he edited their DNA to take out the receptor for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. And there was a whole lot of shock and awe because making inheritable edits, that was a line we had not crossed as a human species. And even the Chinese decided that what he did was premature and wrong, and he was arrested, and he's in jail. But the pandemic maybe opens our minds a bit that we're not quite ready to do inheritable edits. But the notion of using CRISPR to make us less susceptible to viruses, well, that doesn't seem quite as appalling as it did a year and a half ago. That's amazing. Um, I also read recently that, that Vladimir Putin talked about suggesting that you could use CRISPR to create soldiers that don't feel pain or don't feel fear. Um, what can you tell us about that? Is that just sort of an out there idea? No, the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is the biggest funder of the labs at MIT and at Berkeley uh, for many reasons, one of which is Yes, you could make soldiers that are impervious, say, to radiation sickness. Uh, and, you know, Putin went even further and said maybe they'll be impervious to pain. You can also do what DARPA, the Defense Department here in the U.S., is doing, which is say, well, let's create anti-CRISPR, which is just what it sounds like. Just like we and the Russians have ballistic missiles, we also have anti-ballistic missiles. And this would be a way to turn off a CRISPR edit or more specifically, if you use CRISPR to say, uh, edit mosquitoes and have a gene drive. So you make a whole you know, a platoon of mosquitoes that can carry a pathogen. So we have to uh, do defense against this as well. And you talk, I don't wanna to get too granular, but at the same time, I think this is really interesting. You talk about two different types of edits that can be done with CRISPR, um, somatic cell edits and germline edits. Can you walk us through the, the primary difference between the two of those and the impact? Well, germline is what we just discussed about mm -hmm. Hojuan Ki and the Chinese um, doctor. Uh, and it means that you're making edits in reproductive cells so that those are inherited. So it's a pretty simple concept. If you cross the germline, it means you're making inheritable edits. That's a line you may not want to cross for pretty obvious reasons. A somatic edits just means somatic uh, means in the body of the patient. And that's been done quite a bit with no controversy. For example, last year, a woman named Victoria Gray had the stem cells of her blood edited, so she no longer had sickle cell uh, disease. 
And she gave consent. It's not an inheritable edit. So I think one of the first ethical lines in using CRISPR is let's start with the edits that are in patients that give their consent. And let's draw a line right now is what at what you called the germ line, which is even though the Chinese doctor has done it, we should hit pause before we do more inheritable edits. There's a question of, um, you know, if we're not, maybe this only applies to the, to the germline edits, but if we're no longer subject to a random natural lottery when it comes to our endowments, um, is it possible that that could weaken our feelings of empathy and acceptance? Well, yes. I mean, you know, when we have a species that's filled with people tall and short and, you know, fat and skinny and straight and gay and trans and that wonderful diversity is what makes our, our species both resilient but colorful and creative. And we have empathy because we know that maybe somebody who was born blind or born with a genetic defect or even with a, a genetic disease, that it's all part of a random lottery. And we have to be empathetic uh, to those who got dealt maybe sickle cell anemia or something. And that's why we fight such diseases. But <clears throat> I think there are a couple of problems that come if we start doing edits to uh, that are inheritable to our species. One is that maybe the rich would be able to buy, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, better genes for their children. And we'd have a, you know, a genetic elite like in Brave New World or in um, Gattaca. And another is that <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, <clears throat> that, um, that um, we'd edit out the diversity of our species, and that would also be problematic. So I think those are reasons we should have moral qualms, not about CRISPR, but about how we use it and who we decide can use it. Absolutely. It's just uh, really the, the, the issues it raises are just, as you mentioned, just, you know, very significant. Um, you mentioned a, a few questions back, just the, the distinction between the digital revolution, which, of course, you know, we, we're, we're all familiar with, um, and the life science revolution. I mean, which do you think will be end up being more important? And it's OK if you say <laughs> the latter. <laughs> Well, it's actually will be the combination of the digital revolution and the life science revolution. People like Cameron Mirvold, who's the son of Nathan Mirvold, who is one of the great uh, uh, chief technology officers at uh, Microsoft, if I can mention that word. Uh, yeah. But his son is both a computational wizard and a genetic wizard. And that type of computational biology will probably be the future. Uh, I have a little thought experiment, which is in the same class at Harvard, uh, was Mark Zuckerberg and Fong Zhang. Fong Zhang is the person in my book who's the great competitor to Jennifer Doudna and first shows how CRISPR can be used in human cells. It'll be interesting to know 25 years from now, will Fong Zhang's discovery of how to use CRISPR in human cells or Mark Zuckerberg's uh, invention of Facebook what will have been more important to our species? That's amazing. That could be a follow-up book. Um, do you do you see the future of bioengineering belonging to hackers and hobbyists, or professionals, or a combination? Well, I think the digital revolution was pushed forward by people on the electronic frontier, the cyber hackers, who you know, as Steve Jobs would say, they were crazy ones, misfits, and rebels. But the you know people are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So in this 1970s, you had a hobbyist hacker culture at places like the Homebrew Computer Club in Silicon Valley, in which people like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and Bill Gates hung out and with their Altair machines and writing Basic for the Altair. Uh, and they pushed the digital revolution forward in ways that IBM and DEC Computer and others weren't doing. So I always think it's the people on the frontier, sometimes the hackers, that push us forward. Now, obviously, when you're hacking human genes, that's probably uh, a little bit more difficult to do in your garage 
and also it may cause a little bit more cause for concern than when you're hacking, you know, basic for the uh, Intel microprocessor. Uh, but I have in my book a very interesting character, Josiah Zayner, who is one of these biohackers and, you know, has created CRISPR treatments that I've watched him inject into himself to, say, increase muscle mass by regulating myostatin. And he created his own uh, DNA uh, vaccine that he injected into himself. And even though I'm not quite somebody who would go into his garage and do those injections, it made me sign up for the Pfizer trial because I think citizens should be involved in science. We should all you know, do what we can. And I find that the hackers, just like you know, Josiah Zayner is in my book, a little bit like Puck is in A Midsummer Night's Dream, he pops up every now and then when everybody else is wringing their hands to say, you know, what fools these mortals be. Uh, and uh, he offends people. But, you know, if these shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended. We need people like this pushing the human race forward. That's amazing. I love the Shakespearean link. That's incredible. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about your, your just incredible body of work. So, you know, so many of the characters you've written about uh, Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, Ben Franklin, Leonardo da Vinci. They were all innovators and are described as geniuses. But what other common traits do they have? What is the common thread that you've observed? Well, people always say well, they're smart. But man, anybody on this uh, broadcast, anybody at Google has met a lot of smart people. And you end up knowing that smart people are a dime a dozen and they don't really amount to much. What matters is being imaginative or creative, or as Steve Jobs would say, being able to think out of the box and think different. And I think the basic ingredient for that, that all of the characters I've written about share is just curiosity, pure curiosity, not curiosity driven by the need to create a product or something, but curiosity for its own sake. You know, Leonardo da Vinci writing in the margin of his notebook, why is the sky blue? He doesn't need that to paint the Mona Lisa but he tested out spraying water in the air and purified water and trying to figure out why is the sky blue. That struck me because that's in Einstein's notebook. You know, why is the sky blue? And he, he experiments with Lord Rayleigh's formula and gets us another step ahead. Uh, Jennifer Doudna as a young girl growing up in Ilo, Hawaii, marveling at the blue sky and wondering how the sunset turns it pink. Also like Leonardo marveling about why the water spirals when it passes rocks and how the Fibonacci's equations and other mathematical brush strokes show you that it's the same with, you know, the curls uh, of a seashell or the curls of the Mona Lisa. Now we all have that curiosity when we're in our wonder years, but it gets beaten out of us by, you know, grownups who say, quit asking so many silly questions. I think that what's, you know, separates the people I wrote about, Steve Jobs, Jennifer Dowden, Ben Franklin, Albert Einstein, and of course, Leonardo, is they don't outgrow their wonder years. They're always curious about basic things in nature for curiosity's sake. Leonardo had a jotting in one of his notebooks, describe the tongue of a woodpecker. And that inspired me because I was, you know, who would want to know what the tongue of a wood, what, what use is knowing the tongue? But Leonardo did, and he had to find a woodpecker, open its mouth. And so it inspired me that every day I should find 10 or 12 odd things that I'm uh, passionately curious about. That's incredible. Do you think some of that is innate? It's something we're either born with or we're not? I mean, obviously all, you know, all children, as you said, have curiosity, but do you think that passionate curiosity is you either have it or you don't, or you really think it can be, it, it's, it's, it's there in all of us? Mm -hmm. Well, somebody who's just written about the importance of the genetic code, I should say it's innate, but it, I don't think it is. I think there are certain things that are innate. Somehow, you know, Einstein's mental processing power, no matter how hard we try, uh, we're probably not going, except for a few people listening here, are going to equal his mathematical processing power. On the other hand, curiosity, I think, is something that is comes in our childhood because we're just fascinated by things. And I think it's uh, not necessarily innate, but it's natural, meaning we all have a certain amount of curiosity. And I think it's something we can 
learn to nurture in ourselves. We can help grow in ourselves. Uh, there's probably a limit to the amount of mathematical or, um, for my, in my case, musical uh, talent that I might ever have. But I can nurture my own curiosity. Just thinking about all the parents on the call, thinking, how do I, you know, how do I get this? To, how can I? Well, step child? one is to quit saying, don't ask so many, you know, dumb questions. <laughs> I watched it in the airport when I flew back here to New Orleans last night. And there was a kid mesmerized by all the neon signs in the new airport and the wonderful lights and asking this, that, and the other. And finally, I hear the parents say, quit asking so many dumb questions. And I realized we could all nurture in our kids. We just have to wait for three more questions before we say that horrible phrase. You didn't go over and say, this could be the next Jennifer Doubtna. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, as a former journalist myself, I'm fascinated to know a little bit more about your process of how you go about your research when you dive into a project like this. So when you first select a, a, a new subject, what is your, your first, the first thing you do? And are you already thinking about the next person? Well, I'm always gathering string about people who I could write about down the road. And there are two types of books I do, which have separate processes. One is somebody who's alive and one is somebody <laughs> who's been historical. After I wrote about Henry Kissinger, which was a long time ago, my first book, uh, he was such a uh, handful to deal with. I said, next time I'm going to write that somebody who's been dead for 250 <laughs> years. So I did Benjamin Franklin. Likewise, yeah. after Steve Jobs, it's like, okay, now somebody 500 <laughs> years dead, you know, Leonardo. If it's somebody who is a historical figure, I go read everything that they wrote. I read all of Leonardo's notebooks. I read Einstein's notebooks and grapple with his scientific papers. All of Ben Franklin's letters, which were now online, it's easier, but I spent time at the Yale Library going through box after box of letters. What? But it's somebody alive, I read all the background material as fast as I can, and then just start hanging out with them. Not even with a whole set of questions, just sort of saying, hey, tell me about yourself and letting them talk. And I feel I should do that in person over long periods of time. I kind of, as I said, moved into a guest house of Steve Jobs. I moved into, uh, you know, Berkeley, California with my friend, Michael Lewis, who's a New Orleans author as well, who lives right near the campus. So I could just go every day to the uh, lab where Jennifer and all of her colleagues were working. And do you do all the research in whatever form it takes and then stop and then do all the writing or is it not as cut and dried as that? Well, one of the things I learned from my great, but unfortunately late editor, Alice Mayhew, was make it a narrative, make it storytelling. Do like, as she said, the Bible has the best lead sentence. It begins in the beginning, comma. <laughs> and you go chronologically telling the tales of morality and discovery through people. Make it a journey of discovery. So what I do is I gather all the information and I put it on a huge Google Doc that can be shared. Uh, and I do it both as a Google Doc and in Dropbox because I'm kind of paranoid. I want to make sure I've got many copies of things. But then people can add to it if they have things. Uh, but I keep it strictly chronological so that when I begin writing, I make it a narrative storytelling because something that happens, say, to Jennifer Dowden in graduate school when her advisor says, always ask the big questions, and she says, what is the big question about RNA? And he says, how did life begin on this planet? Well, that affects what she does next when she gets to Berkeley. So I keep it chronological. And yes, once I start writing, I'm still reporting. And halfway through this book, by you know the end of 2019, I had half the book written. I was writing along and then coronavirus struck. And uh, then the babies were had been born in China. And so I go back to reporting and I say, OK, let's extend this book for another couple of years because we're going to have to turn our attention to the coronavirus. Yeah. And what other ways did the pandemic and the coronavirus impact your process for this book? Well, uh, one interesting way is that um, instead of hanging out in the labs, I hung around in the Slack channels and in the um, Zoom meetings and of Jennifer Doudna and of Fong Jang and of Emmanuel Charpentier and uh, George Church. 
and I got to report in real time. Instead of asking questions like, what did you think when you first discovered uh, that uh, this guide RNA could be combined into a single guide, I got to watch as they discovered, you know, how do we use such a guide to make a detection tool for the coronavirus? And I'm there as they're sort of doing it in the Slack channel, putting up experimental results. I'm there in the meeting that evening on Zoom when they're talking about it. So the book gets to take on a flavor of real time adventure as, you know, I don't know and they don't know how the next experiment's gonna turn out, but I'm getting to report it in real time. That's amazing. And I, I wonder if it were normal times. I mean, you, you might not have been led into every single physical room uh, or, or certainly you would have been, people would have noticed more if, if uh, oh, Walter's here. Um, <laughs> there might be a benefit to having, you know, being able to just sit in a, in a virtual meeting. That's true. But I tell you, having been vaccinated and traveling <laughs> a lot right now, I love being with people in person. Yeah. I think there's just more you get out of it. Absolutely. And, and what is Jennifer like as a subject? I mean, you know, we can read about her in the book, but, you know, this is a big deal for someone like her. I mean, obviously she had been, um, she had achieved notoriety before, but, but what, was, what was she like as a subject? Well, she has one flaw as a central character. Unlike Steve Jobs or even Einstein or, you know, Leonardo, she doesn't, you know, she's just nice. She doesn't have a dark side you know, or a rough edges, you know, that can get her in. Now she's uh, competitive. She's still in a patent battle with Fong Zhang and the Broad Institute. Uh, she's very ambitious, but I consider those attributes, not flaws, uh, to be ambitious and competitive. She's genuinely nice and very grounded. I mean, you know, she has a now there's book out on her that's, you know, doing well, the Nobel Prize and the coronavirus thing. And yet she's just, you know, like me and you, she's easy to talk to, always, although tightly scheduled, always seems to have time to look you in the eye or to help mentor somebody who wants advice. So she has that perfect match of something everybody at Google would know, which is the need for competition and cooperation to be interwoven. Can you talk about that a little bit, just that rivalry and the race for discoveries between her and Feng Zhang a little bit, since we didn't really touch on it? Yeah, after June of 2012, when Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna published their paper on how you can engineer CRISPR to cut DNA, uh, that's done in a test tube using cells that are from bacteria and other organisms like that. The question is, will it work in human beings? Um, and if you're a patent lawyer, you know that there's a, a term of art called obviousness. And it's just what it sounds like, which is, was it obvious that if it worked in this test tube in the bacteria cells, it would also work in human cells. Well, they race to show it could work in human cells. And there's almost a dead heat, a photo finish, six months later in January, 2013. Fong Zhang publishes a paper the first week of January saying, here's how you optimize the system to work in human cells. So does George Church, his advisor, uh, his former advisor when he was a graduate student. And that's a great rivalry and bitterness there because Fong Zhang did not tell George Church that he was competing against, that he was racing against him to make this work in humans. And finally, Jennifer Doudna publishes two weeks later and they all get patents, but the patents conflict. So they're all fighting these patent battles. But the good thing is when they all turn their attention to fighting the coronavirus, instead of fighting over priority of publication or of patents or of prizes, they've put them on public servers uh, to be in the public domain saying, we're not a, we've just made this discovery about a detection tool or how to use a uh, enzyme to cut the coronavirus. And we're putting it in the public domain so anybody can use it for free. So I think that helped remind all of them 
that although they're in it for patents and prizes and uh, publications, they're also in it to help the human species and they're in it for noble reasons. For the greater good, absolutely. Yeah. So I wanna remind everyone that um, uh, you can uh, enter your questions in the chat. We'll get to them in just a minute. I have one or two more questions before we do. Um, kind of uh, picking up on what you were just talking about, um, Walter, based on having immersed yourself in this topic, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on to what extent discoveries depend on individual genius and to what extent teamwork has become more critical. Yes, teamwork has become more critical, <clears throat> whether you know it's in creating the algorithms at Google or creating the ways to do uh, uh, biotechnology. Uh, because you need teams, including the one Jennifer formed, if you're gonna do CRISPR, that have people who understand microorganisms, but also people understand chemistry and people understand structural biology and the structure of molecules. And those teams all pool their resources. And patents and prizes tend to be distorting because the prizes have to go to two or three people and the patents have to go to one primary inventor. And that distorts the collaboration that really pushes science forward. That said, even though it's all a, a, that creativity is a collaborative process and innovation's a team sport, it gets pushed forward by people who have a particular passion, a particular insight. You know, it took a lot of people to create Google, but without Sergey and Larry, you know, it wouldn't have been pushed the way it was pushed. And so I always, whether it's, I wrote a book called The Innovators, which is about teamwork in the digital revolution, but also I wrote about Steve Jobs, because even though he said his greatest product was the team he created at Apple, it was him who really touched the surface of history with his fingers and it sent out the ripples. So I like showing that mix of individual initiative and then collaborative uh, teamwork. So when I was a journalist back at Fortune, I spent a lot of time studying women leaders um, and, and there's a whole body of research on how they, they lead differently. Um, and I'm just wondering, and, and being more collaborative is one thing, and these have been proven out with, with research mm -hmm. and everything, but having written about so many uh, innovative um, men and then writing about Jennifer as the first female subject of, of a book of yours, uh, do, do you think there anything, did that, did she bring anything additional to the table by virtue of, um, of being, being a woman? Yeah. I mean, you know, she had faced headwinds because she was a woman. She had a school counselor who told the girls don't do science. Uh, you know, so she has a certain insecurity that came from that but also a certain persistence because she decided to persist. Um, she's very collegial. Uh, I, uh, don't, I try not to make sweeping generalizations or seven secrets of success type pronouncements in my book because I just write narratives about real people. Uh, I know the stuff you're talking about at Fortune that you read and worked on about who are more collaborative as leaders. Certainly Jennifer and Emmanuel Charpentier and Jillian Banfield, the women in this book, uh, they were very, very collaborative and that uh, in a friendly collegial way and that helped them. But also uh, they had a particular strength because they had been locked out or somewhat excluded from the Human Genome Project, which was a whole lot of alpha males, you know, people like Francis Collins and Craig Venter and Eric Lander, all sequencing the human genome in the 1990s. And people like Julian Banfield and Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer uh, decided to focus on RNA. Uh, partly, Jennifer said it was not just because she was a woman, but she said when she used to play soccer as a kid, everybody used to run for the ball, probably the boys more than the girls. And she loved to play a position on the field where she could see the whole field to be where the other people weren't. And so likewise, she goes and does RNA research. So I have a lot in my book that'll be primary grist for people who wanna write these stories of are women more collaborative or women more thinking out of the box or men more aggressive. I kind of let the reader make that decision. I just tell the story of three very interesting women 
four or five very interesting guys and the race they had to alter the human species. That's amazing. Well, you, you tell it like no one else can. Um, okay, I think we're, we're gonna go to the questions. So I think we're ready to put the first one up on the screen. Uh, this is from John Singer. Thank you for your time today, Walter. I look forward to reading your new book. I'm curious what personality slash habitual similarities did you observe between Dr. Doudna and Steve Jobs? Good question. Good question. Not all that many. Um, meaning uh, Steve Jobs had what was famously called the reality distortion field. He pushed people like crazy. He drove them crazy, but he also drove them to do things uh, that they didn't know they could do. And I watched him put together teams and he liked to put together teams that had creative tension in which people were really elbows out and jostling with each other. Jennifer, when I watched her build teams at her labs at Berkeley and her companies, she made sure that any new person that would come in as a postdoc or as an employee would meet everybody else on the team and they'd all go out to dinner and the team would decide whether they fit in. And I asked her, I said, Steve Jobs used to uh, you know, do the opposite. He'd want people who would upset the apple cart, who would challenge the thinking of the team, who would be abrasive at times as Steve was. And I said, aren't you gonna lose out on that abrasiveness that might cause creative tension? And she said, yes, maybe so, but this is my way of doing teams. I like people to trust each other, to work, stay up all night and have each other's back when it comes to experiments. So I think the differences are probably greater than the similarities. And if we had all day, I could talk about the passion they had for details. They both knew to ask the big picture, like what could we do if we had a personal computer you could take out of the box and just plug in? Or if we had a thousand songs in our pocket? or if we could edit our own DNA. But they also were passionate enough for perfection that they knew that God was in the details. It was how did that protein fold or how the shape of the RNA made it a key to its uh, function. Or in Steve's case, how did the chamfers on this iPhone curve in a way to make it human uh, friendly so that it felt like you could connect to it. So I think asking the big picture, but knowing God is in the details is a attitude that they shared. So now I've given you something they didn't share <laughs> and something they did. Something, something they did. That, that, and I can thank Mr. Singer for that good question. <laughs> That's a great question. All right, let's see what we have next. Let's take the next question. Uh, from Preeti Raghavan. How do you go about learning about complex subjects so quickly? How do you organize all the information? Great question. Yeah, I actually love science. My father was an engineer, my uncle, my cousin, my brother. Uh, I, you know, when I was doing the technology books, it was fun because we had a basement workshop where I had to sort out all the transistors. I'm not sure anybody on this Zoom meeting, uh, this meeting will know what a transistor is, but they're the things you etch on microchips. Uh, but how the difference between a capacitor and a resistor or condenser is there sometimes, and all these things. So I had a feel for how circuits worked. Now I'm not obviously a great engineer myself, but I'm totally in love with, uh, you know, circuits and engineering. Likewise, just like Jennifer Doudna's father gave her the double helix when she was in sixth grade, my dad here in New Orleans gave me a copy of the double helix when I was in middle school. I just found it not too long ago. Wow. And the pale red cover, it would be worth something on eBay, except for it has all my marginal scratches, <laughs> defining words I didn't know like biochemistry. Um, so I've always been interested in science. And I think one problem with science is that most scientists aren't very good at explaining to the average person the beauty of what they do. And so, and part of that started with Einstein. You know, up until Einstein, people like Ben Franklin or Thomas Jefferson or Edison would think you were a Philistine if you didn't keep up with science. But Einstein made it seem a little you know, scary, a little difficult that you had to be Einstein to understand it. So I decided to write a book about him that I hope demystified the science a bit 
by showing in a narrative way how he made each step. And uh, biochemistry wasn't that hard. I love it. And even some of the technology, uh, digital technology, I love it and can do. The hardest thing I ever did was I had to take courses in tensor calculus because I wanted to understand the math underlying general relativity, which is a tensor calculus and the, you know, and how the fabric of space time bends and folds and in an iterative way with moving objects. And then I left all the math out of the book, but I felt I had to learn that. And that was a year of struggling to learn uh, the fundamentals of uh, tensor calculus. Oh my God, for your your readers are grateful to you because you did all that work. I so left it would out be able too. To, well, <laughs> right, but you would be able to understand it to communicate what you needed to to them, which is which is the art. Um, let's uh, let's see uh, another question, please, from Amara Vedi. Hey, Walter, we have a problematic history with the social and scientific history of eugenics. How do we avoid our missteps? Is regulation possible? First of all, regulation is possible. I mean, it's not like the atom bomb, which, you know, is very hard to build in your basement. I mean, even I could do CRISPR editing, but we regulate drugs. We regulate vaccines, you know, the FDA. And, and Jennifer, in my book, there's a whole process of her gathering Chinese scientists from the National Academy there, uh, Duan Jingpei, who I went over and talked to, also the British and the Europeans. So we could have international guidelines and regulations on the use of CRISPR technology, especially when it comes to inheritable edit. And yeah, there'd be some people, you know, who might violate it, but you could keep it 95% contained, which is all uh, you really have to do. But when you talk about eugenics, you're talking about state-sponsored eugenics. Obviously, the Nazi program being the one that uh, is just so gruesome. But even in the United States in the early 20th century at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, there was eugenics based on state ideas for how to create a better you know, citizenry. I don't think we have that problem now because I don't think the state will ever mandate any eugenics. But here's a concept uh, you should think about, which is free market eugenics. If we allow it totally to be up to the individual and you could go into fertility clinics or other places and be given a shopping list as if you're at a genetic supermarket and we allow free choice. So we allow parents to say, yeah, I'd like six inches taller. I'd like more IQ points. I'd like blonde hair. I'd like this sexual orientation. I don't want this skin color. I don't want this eye color, whatever. Then you could see how we could end up and the thought experiments are through the book where we, you know, I try to go hand in hand with the readers and the religious leaders and the politicians to say, if we leave this totally to the free market and allow everybody to buy better genes for their children, if they can afford them, you will have a eugenics that has some of the same outcomes as state sponsored eugenics, but it will be a um, liberal, free market or libertarian eugenics. So I want readers to do that thought experiment as well. Absolutely. I think we have at least one more question. Let's see if we can take one or two more. From Nipen Modi, out of all the historical figures you have researched, whom would you like to meet most? <laughs> I think Leonardo. He was the person who best knew uh, everything you could possibly learn about every subject that was knowable. And to me, when you mentioned earlier, what are the secrets of success that they share? That's another one, which is trying to understand the humanities as well as the sciences, to understand the liberal arts as well as engineering. Steve Jobs always ended his product uh, presentation with that intersection of the street signs of the liberal arts versus uh, intersecting with um, technology. And if you love as Leonardo did, as Ben Franklin did, as Jennifer Doudna did, as Steve Jobs did, everything from to take Steve Jobs, you know, dance and calligraphy and music, as well as engineering and circuits and microprocessors, or like Leonardo, you love art and anatomy, as well as math and medicine and music and zoology, then you see patterns. And those patterns ripple 
across the beauty of nature. You see the patterns of the swirling water and the curls of the hair and of the math of those curls. And so people who see those patterns, to me, are the most creative. And Leonardo is the exemplar of that. And plus, he was, he'd be a good person to have around. He liked uh, drink. He liked song. He liked amusement. He liked role-playing games. He loved uh, life. And um, uh, so I'd rather have dinner with him, I think. <laughs> I would, too. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, OK, let's see another question. From Mike Thraman, what is the toughest challenge that you face during the research of contemporary subjects? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, one of the difficult challenges is these are real people. And Steve Jobs, those of you who've read the book, no, he had a lot of rough edges. He could be, you know, a jerk at times. There's a technical term out in Silicon Valley that begins with an A, and he could be that at times. And you want to put that in, but you don't want to overdo it because that's not who he was. It wasn't just that he was a jerk. In fact, sometimes pushing people and being aggressive is what pushed the greatness into people. But you're dealing with a real person, especially in the case of Steve Jobs, somebody who was you know, sick and then dying. And so you want to leave out certain things that you think just might be interpreted wrong and, you know, bad, but you also want to paint the full picture. Uh, I think there are certain biographers and journalists who are very good at just being tough as nails and uh, not worrying about what a living person may think or their family, but I, I care about those things. So I sometimes have the problem of not wanting to really piss off people that I'm writing about, yet also wanting to get the truth in its unvarnished form into the book. Absolutely. Um, well, I'll just close with uh, two more questions of my own, just um, you know, before we let you go. Um, we, since you're here at Google, I have to ask you this. Is there a Google product that you can't live without? Well, I, many. I mean, first of all, I marvel as I've had ever since it was called page rank and back rub after Larry Page, at how the algorithm for search at Google is just so much better. And, and you know, that iterative process of making it better. And I teach the digital revolution in my class at Tulane. And we talk about monopolies. And I say sometimes a monopoly is totally valid, not that Google search is necessarily a monopoly, but it's a dominant field. And I'm sure there are people questioning on the antitrust front, but it's totally valid because it was earned by creating a better product. And the law permits that, but we permit that as a society. So, I mean, I could not live without Google search. I was just on a island the past week with some friends and, you know, we didn't have really good and and anytime we're having a conversation, we almost grab for our phones and want to do a Google search to figure something out. And when you couldn't, your fingers get itchy. I love Google Docs as well. And I'm just blown away by Google Maps. I can't quite figure out how every single corner and every single building on this speck of a Caribbean island is there on Google Maps. And uh, the combination of mapping technology and GPS uh, I'm not just saying this because I'm on a Google call. I will have to do a Microsoft call and I'll say, hey, Bing didn't <laughs> cut it. And why weren't you into maps? And my God, you built the Zune instead of the iPhone. So, uh, uh, but this Google products, those three are ones I couldn't live without. Well, those are three amazing ones. And, and there's a lot of people who work very hard on those. And I, I love how you pulled out the search in particular because people work so hard on search. There's a saying among the search team that search is a problem that will never be solved. And I loved that when mm -hmm. I heard it because it really- You know, I, when I was doing coronavirus, what really stunned me, take the word spike. You know, the word spike is something we've used on. And all of a sudden, Google knows that when I'm searching at, with the word spike and protein, you know, I'm not l looking for a spike and a hot dog on top of it. It suddenly gives me all of the papers on the coronavirus's uh, shell. And how quickly 
it, uh, Google search can adapt to uh, uh, changing things. Well, that was a natural language processing milestone that was achieved, um, something called BERT that I, I, there are people on this call far better than me to explain that to you, but we would love to tell you more about that. Um, Lastly, I'll just ask you before we go, what has life been like for you during the pandemic and what have you missed most? I mean, you sort of alluded to it with travel, just being out there a little bit now. Um, you know, man is a, or humans are a social animal as Aristotle said, or maybe Plato, I can't remember. But, and I, I suffer that uh, trait, which is I love being around other people. Uh, I was pretty good during the pandemic, but I, down here in New Orleans, we went out with friends, you know, we still had meals together and we tried to socially distance. We tried to eat outside whenever possible. But I think that humans crave interaction with other humans. That's what sparks creativity. And so uh, I, during the pandemic here in New Orleans, uh, I tried to be as good as you could be, but I really missed real human interactions with my students at Tulane, with the friends I went out with. And so I was glad Tulane actually never sent kids home. It was always in person, even though socially distanced and careful. All of my lectures are now a YouTube playlist. If anybody wants to look at the lecture about how Larry and Sergey figured out that a hot dog was not just the same as a warm puppy when you're doing the search. Uh, that's in my book uh, and in my uh, YouTube Digital Revolution Tulane lectures. But I also went to campus. I, you know, I just wanted to see the students. And now that I've, I was in the early Pfizer vaccine trial, so I got a leg up on being vaccinated. But uh, being with other people, um, I think it's important. And I can't wait for Google to have its headquarters back open. I was just going to say, well, we'd love to have you back in person. So um, well, I've been there, you know, <laughs> both in uh, the Valley and in New York, been to the meetings there, and I can't wait to get back. Great. Well, we'd love that. But Walter, I can't thank you enough. Uh, we at Google can't thank you enough for spending time with us, for sharing your incredible insights from your just incredible new book. And um, I encourage everyone on the call to read it. And, and we wish you the best. So thank you so much. It's great to see you again, too. By the way, Leo, it's great to be with you finally in person, having read your book, and uh, uh, Google's very lucky to have you. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. We're lucky to have you, too. Thanks again, Thanks. Walter. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.